Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to, to Dry Run Baptist Church. Um, Pastor Rob and I shaved. No, I'm joking. I told him I was going to do that, though. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in the first chapter of Nehemiah. Um, and so to understand the, the book of Nehemiah, we must first understand the history of Israel up to that point. And we must understand that Israel had been in a cycle of disobedience. Um, and this disobedience had led to promises of exile that God had made through Moses, Joshua, and Jeremiah. And it was a severe punishment. And it was God putting an end to this cycle. This cycle was a short time of obedience, followed by disobedience, and then punishment from God, and then Israelite, the Israelites crying out for help, God sending deliverance, and then back to short-lived obedience. It's a vicious cycle. And then this was God removing his blessing of keeping Israel's enemies at bay to God placing his hand against Israel. And so he gave Israel over to their enemies to be captured and removed from their home. And, you know, this wouldn't have been a surprise or it shouldn't have been a surprise to the Israelites considering that they had been thoroughly warned for many, many years. And God did not commit some sort of sneak attack, kung fu attack on them. And so it was God's righteous... It was just and righteous on God's part, right? And sometimes timeouts don't work, and you have to take away their toys. you got to throw them away. And so this exile, it took place um, <clears throat> over about 80 years, 85 years, and it took place in three stages. The first was being when the Assyrians took over northern Israel or the, king, the house of Israel, and then followed secondly by the Babylonians taking over Judah, or the southern part of Israel. And then finally, with Babylon coming back after a resurgence and destroying Jerusalem and the temple and the walls. And so this was not just a geographical separation of God's people from their home, but it was a spiritual separation from their God as well. And so by the time we get back to Nehemiah, there have been two returns all right, already to Israel. One was whenever King Cyrus defeated the Babylonians and sent out an edict, and this edict was to say that those who had been captured by the people that Persia had captured could go back to their countries and rebuild their spiritual temples, and they could go back to having this religious freedom. Uh, King Cyrus thought of himself as a man of God, however, he did not pick which God he was a man of. He was a man of all the gods, he said. Um, and so the second one was with Ezra, which is the book that takes place before Nehemiah, Whenever they returned, and this was under King Darius, who allowed for this edict to take place as well until there was rumors of another resurgence. And at that point in time, Persia's support for Israel had ended for the rebuilding of the temple. And so this brings us to Nehemiah, who is the royal cupbearer, or royal cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. And so if you don't mind to stand in honor of the reading of the word of God. All right, Nehemiah says... The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanai, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates destroy, are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continue, continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, that, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power 
and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of the servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servants today and grant him mercy in the sight of this, in the sight of this man. Now I was cut bare to the king. Pray with me, please. Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to learn um, from your word, Lord, and to, to see how you have provided just punishment to those who uh, rightly deserved it, Lord. But we also see that you had such love and compassion and mercy on those who repented, Lord. And we see that you had chosen these people to be a nation of holiness, to be a holy nation, and to show those around them that you are the one true God, Lord, and that you're a God of all nations. And so we pray, Lord, that your word will be heard here today. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. All right. So in verses 1 to 3, we see that Nehemiah's brother and some fellow Judeans have visited him in Susa, which is the citadel. This is where uh, the king hung out. And where he asked about his fellow Judeans who had escaped previously from exile and went back to Judah. And he asked about Jerusalem itself. And we find out that the ones who had actually left or who had escaped this exile were in great distress, shame, and that the holy city of Jerusalem was in shambles, had no temple, no gates, and no walls. And we see that Nehemiah's reaction to this was sorrow and grief for his fellow Israelites in Jerusalem. And he was grieved for their well-being. And so as someone who is in captivity himself, he knew what life was like living under the Persians and being in captivity. They were probably pretty well versed considering that, well, it had been happening for about the past 80 years. And so <clears throat> he knew what it was like for them to be there. Even though some of them had gotten to return to their country, they had no military, no temple, no walls to protect them. And they also knew that those who governed were very strict with their taxes. They, those taxes were extreme. It was, set in a place, it was set up so that the rich got richer, the middle class became broke, and the poor got dead. And so even though they had religious freedom to worship God, they had zero economic status. And once more, their temple was destroyed. And so due to this, Nehemiah... His first go-to in this situation upon hearing this news uh, brings us to our first point, which is because God is great and awesome, prayer is our first and only option. Mm -hmm. And so we see that Nehemiah goes straight to God in prayer in this distress. And he goes not just for a small time or a little bit of time, but he goes for days. And he's not just praying, he's fasting and praying. And so Nehemiah is a man of prayer. This is the first of nine prayers recorded in the book of Nehemiah, and it's the longest. He truly prays without ceasing. And instead of being one who says, well, all else has failed, I might as well pray, he goes straight to prayer in the first and only, goes straight to prayer. It is his first and only option in this case and not his last resort. And so how many times have us or people we know um, done everything we, else, everything we can to solve a problem, but until at the very end we go to God and we wonder, you know, why it hasn't been answered. When the last thing that we do is we go to God. We would rather go to a voodoo witch doctor to solve a, a common cold than what we would to pray to God. And so we, when we as Christians have prayer as our first option and not the last, the second, third, or any option, it indicates that we truly believe and uh, depend on God in all things, not just the small things. So if you're not first, you're last. Um, and so I will be the first to admit that I'm also guilty of not doing this or not going to prayer as my first and only option. I often consider things to be trivial to God. And that's a human concept to, to think of things as trivial or small. Uh, things that we consider small and great in our human minds aren't necessarily small and great to God. Uh, they're all small in reality. And so these small things, you know, such as doing well in a class or doing well at work, losing weight, you know, whatever it may be, they seem so small to me to think that I even need to go to God in the first place. And I think, why would God be concerned about them? But I realize that it isn't that God isn't concerned with them, it's that I'm not wholly dependent on God. And that I lack faith to think that He can handle the small things. But at the same time, if I can't have faith, that God can handle the small things, such as passing a test or, you know, Culver's having peanut butter ice cream or whatever it is, 
then how can I expect or believe or have faith that God is going to handle the large things or what I would consider large? How would it be that if I had a major disease or illness that if I can't believe that God can handle something so small and trivial that he's going to be able to handle something so large in comparison? <clears throat> and so there are no small things to the God who created the world, the universe, and who brought people back from the dead and who rained down fire on those who opposed his prophets. And so not only does Nehemiah not cease praying, but he also fasts, and this isn't the fast that we consider with the fad diet of intermittent starving, as it's so been, as it's been put so well. But this is to fast in the fact that he gives up food and the things that his body needs because prayer, and his prayer is so much more greater. It's the only thing that he desires in this moment. And in this moment of great sorrow and mourning, the fact that Nehemiah's brothers and sisters, countrymen, and the city, and the temple have all been destroyed is greater than his need to have a little bit of food. And so Nehemiah gives up food and sustenance because of this desire. And so this desire is not for food, it, and it makes him more fervent, it makes him more serious, it shows his seriousness, and it humbles him before his almighty God that he is praying to. And so not only is Nehemiah mourning, fasting, praying, but he's also persistent in his prayer. And Nehemiah states that he prayed for days. We don't know how long or how many days that it is, but he does say that he prayed for day and night. And so this perseverance and fasting show that Nehemiah has placed his faith and priorities in God. And so Nehemiah has faith that God will answer his prayers. And Andrew Mary said that don't let delay shake your faith, for it is faith that will provide the answer in time. Each believing prayer is a step nearer to the final victory. It ripens the fruit, conquers hindrances in, in the unseen world, and hastens the end. Child of God, give the Father time. He is long-suffering over you. He wants your blessing to be rich, full, and sure. Give him time, but continue praying day and night. And so many times we don't see the answer to our prayers as quick as what we would hope. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray. It doesn't mean that, shot, that God is not listening. And it doesn't mean that God's not going to answer. It's just that we don't know of God's timetable, His plan, or what His will is for our lives. However, we do know that He is faithful. Amen. And Scripture tells us that, and tells us that. We know that we are to pray, and we see examples of what prayer should look like in the Scripture. We see that the people of God pray, and it is important that they do so. However, it is not enough that we just say a lay me down to sleep or a mealtime prayer. No, our prayers need to have content. They need to come from the heart. They need to be honest and genuine. And let's face it, God knows exactly why we're praying to begin with. And so this brings us to our second point. Because God is great and awesome, our prayers must be genuine. Or genuine, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1 is a great example of what a genuine prayer from someone who relies on God should look like. And it consists of four main sections. And this first section is the acknowledgement of who God is in comparison to Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah acknowledges who God is in relation to himself and the world around him. He acknowledges that God is great and awesome, that God is the keeper of covenants and steadfast love. And Nehemiah knows and believes that he is praying to the God of the universe, the creator. And so he doesn't pray to a little God, but he prays to a big God. And we need to acknowledge who God is, and we need to acknowledge that He is the Creator, the Great, the Awesome, and that He is also the Keeper of Covenants. You know, when we see people of the Bible pray, they all have one thing in common. They know who they are praying to. And so Jesus prayed until He sweated blood, and He knew exactly who He was praying to. Elijah knew who He was praying to when He was facing off against 400 prophets of Baal. He knew that even though the country had turned against Him and turned against their God, and back to worship another prophet such as Baal, or not a prophet, but a fake god such as Baal, that God was still in control. And this gave great distress to him when he didn't think that anyone else in his country was serving the God. But God reassured him that there were still people out there who were serving him. And God made it known that he was the one and truly God. And so he knew that God was in control. And so when you know that the God of the Bible is the one that you are praying to, you know exactly what God can do. And secondly, 
Nehemiah's prayer was confessional and repentant. Nehemiah confessed not only for his sins, but also the sins of his father, the sins of his countrymen. He acknowledges that the sins have been committed against God for his whole country and how they were corrupt, didn't keep the commandments or the law. Nehemiah also acknowledges that their sins had ramifications and that their sin is what caused them to be in their exile, to have their home stripped away from them and to be spiritually separate from God. And so how many people do we know that probably prays for the whole world or the whole people that they know, the sins of everyone, or confesses the sins of those around them and repent for them? You know, we're responsible for our own sins. However, Nehemiah was so burdened that he confesses to God his acknowledgement of the sins of his fathers and country. Just as Joshua warned in Joshua 28 to leave the sins of the fathers behind, Israel did not, and they paid the price. Nehemiah, though, confesses and repents for his nation. I've never really repented for anyone besides myself, especially the sins of my nation. Uh, however, if I did, I don't think I'd ever leave my knees. I'd never be able to eat, and I'd probably die before I got all of the sins from six hours of starvation. <clears throat> and so you see, Nehemiah, he understood where he was and understood why he was there. He understood that repentance was the only way forward. True repentance, a 180-degree turn from the sin that had caused the exile. He knew that himself, his fathers, and his country were the ones to break that covenant, that God did not break covenants. It is not in God's nature to break the covenants, and even though Israel kept breaking theirs, God still kept giving them chances. And as we've seen earlier, with Hebrews, God gave us a better covenant, one that couldn't be broken. Amen. Because the first one, or the second one, there's the second one, that he made with Israel at uh, Mount Sinai was broken. It was broken very quickly. It didn't last very long by the Israelites. They, uh, like a kid that you tell not to touch the stove, but they do it anyways. They get burnt. <clears throat> and so God was always faithful, and God always upheld the covenant, even when it had been broken. And sin destroys. That's just what it does. It destroys you from the inside out. And so from personal experience, I can tell you that sin will destroy every bit of you, your relationships, and your soul. It is a plague that becomes all-consuming. It is darkness that you stumble around in without a lot. And Israel had been destroyed. They were broken, ruined, and in shambles. Away from their home and away from their God, a nation called to holiness who is anything but... Sin and disobedience destroyed an entire nation and built up those around it. And so that is why Nehemiah confessed and repented for his country. He knew that he and everyone he knew was corrupt and disobedient. However, in the third part of Nehemiah's prayer, after this power, powerful confession, we see hope. We see hope that we can trust God's promises through repentance. And so this poor guy is crying probably like a hard baby cry. He hasn't showered, hasn't eaten, and probably hasn't used the bathroom in about 72 hours, but he has hope. He has hope that God keeps his promises when approached by a repentant heart. And then not only does he have hope that God keeps his promises, he knows that God will keep his promises. And he quotes Moses. That is, if, he, that if his people will repent and turn from their corruptness, that God will restore them and that God will redeem them with, it, with his strong and powerful hand. And Nehemiah knows that God will restore them, that they just need to repent and turn from their corrupt and disobedient ways. We too have this same promise, that if we repent, God is faithful to forgive. Amen. Confession of our sins and a repentance for them is an extremely important part of our Christian life. And so we must confess our sins because we have them. First John tells us that. And we must repent of them because we are commanded to. And we must have hope that we are forgiven because we are promised that we are. A life of repentance is what the Christian is called to. And so to the Israelites, they had sacrifices. Not because they were all gung-ho about killing everything, but because they needed forgiveness. And so we need forgiveness as well. And lastly, we see that Nehemiah's prayer finishes with him being a willing servant. Nehemiah wasn't praying 
for uh, his best life or for a jet that's nicer than his current one. He wasn't praying for an easier life of fame, wealth, or popularity. And he wasn't praying for a new Xbox or PlayStation. Nehemiah was praying that God would redeem Israel and that he would do it based on the promises that he had made. And so Nehemiah called on God to hear the prayer of his servant Nehemiah and the prayers of the other servants pleading with him. And so we see that it was a group effort and that we are to pray in groups for a common goal. <clears throat> Not the common goal of, say, winning a football game, but imagine, for example, if everyone in the U.S. prayed for countries that were hostile to the gospel. What if we prayed that those countries would, that their hearts would not be so hard to the gospel and that they would let it in? Imagine what would be done if over 300 million people had prayed for a common goal. Imagine how far the gospel would go. Imagine that countries like North Korea would let missionaries in of their own volition and not have to sneak in without the fear of dying or being locked up and tortured. Imagine what would happen to the hearts of dictators and tyrants around the world. And so the book of Nehemiah not only highlights what a servant's heart and man of prayer should be about, so Nehemiah doesn't only highlight what a servant's heart should be or what his prayer life should be, but it shows the importance of the people of God working together. And so we see this importance, examples of this in the New Testament and the Old Testament alike. <clears throat> and so, for example, if we look at the church in Acts, they had exponential growth, and they did it without Facebook or YouTube or MySpace. You know, it was a community of believers who prayed together, served together, worshipped together, and ate together. And this community aspect of prayer and service works to unify, encourage, and inspire, just like it did in Nehemiah's case. And so this brings us to our last point. Our prayers show our faith. And so if we look at verse 11, Nehemiah has confidence in God that even though he faces enormous obstacles, that God is going to be faithful. And so as royal cupbearer to the king, who is now Artaxerxes, he is in a position of trust, one of the most trusted people in all of Persia. And so, for example, the royal cupbearer was supposed to test wine and offer wines and make sure that you know, people came who need to come and really like a, a safeguard for the king. <clears throat> and so Nehemiah knew that the edicts that had been passed that had prevented people from going back to Israel to uh, rebuild the temple could not be changed. When a king made an edict during the Medes' time, it was set in stone. Okay? And so <clears throat> Nehemiah knew that this first obstacle was having Artaxerxes overturned or put in a new decree that stopped, that would allow for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And it was, like I said, it was near impossible. And we see this, for example, with Daniel and King Darius. He had to throw Daniel in the lines then, not because he wanted to, but because Daniel's enemies said, King, you've come in and you've made this decree that anyone who doesn't do X has to have Y happen. And so because King Darius had made that decree, Daniel had to be thrown in with the lines then in the lion's den. It couldn't be changed. And so we also see the same thing in Esther. The king couldn't rescind his decree to kill the Judeans or the slaughter of the Judeans, but instead he issues a second decree that allows the Judeans to fight back. And so to get past this decree was the first obstacle, and it was, seemed like the only obstacle from where he was standing. But even with this obstacle, Nehemiah understands that King Artaxerxes is just a man. That even though he was king, he was powerful. Persia was a very powerful empire. It was vast. And they conquered everyone around Israel. And even with that, Nehemiah still knew that his power, compelled, or, uh, his power paled in comparison to the great and awesome God. Amen. The one that separated the sea, unleashed plagues on Egypt, and created everything that they knew. And so even with that knowledge, Nehemiah still had patience. It would be four months, four months before God answered his prayers. After this prayer, it would be four months until God answered it, which seems like a pretty short time when you think about some things that take a long time, um, you know, cancer or whatever. Uh, but still, four months is a long time to wait whenever you know that everybody you love and know is, is dying because, you know, they can't afford food or your temple has been destroyed, your city doesn't have walls, your people aren't protected. Um, it's a long time to wait. 
You know, and sometimes in the Old Testament we see that God gives an answer very quickly. However, in Nehemiah's case, it wasn't as quick as probably what he had hoped. But Nehemiah is still a man of perseverance. And this should be a lesson to each and every one of us that when we pray with the right motives and then we pray as a community and when we pray without ceasing, that we are still on God's timetable. Nehemiah was exactly where God wanted him to be. He was one of the most trusted advisors to one of the most powerful men at that time. <clears throat> and so Nehemiah had extensive influence over the king. And as, and, you know, as he was trusted so much, and we see the evidence of this trust in chapter 2 and just how close Nehemiah was with King Artaxerxes. Artis- Artis- you know, and we've heard Nehemiah be preached about leadership and how to have leadership qualities or, you know, how to get her done. You know, but Nehemiah is really not about this. Nehemiah is about being a willing, obedient servant and being a man of prayer and doing what it is that God has you to do. It is also about a man who is mournful and had sorrow for his country and those around him. Well, you also see later in Nehemiah that as a servant of God, that he puts the well-being of his people before his own. You know, Nehemiah, uh, he was appointed governor of, of the region, and as this, he could have gotten very wealthy and had anything he ever wanted. However, he gave this back to the people so that they would have food. Um, he made sure that they were protected. <clears throat> and so that is what Nehemiah is about. Nehemiah is, having a re- is about having a repentant heart and a man of prayer. And so the Jews, they, you know, they were God's people. They had a special relationship with him as such. You know, they had a land given to them, blessings upon blessings, and prophets with whom God spoke to. However, now we are God's chosen people, the elect. We're Christians. And we may not have a land that we've been given flowing with milk and honey, and we may not have prophets who rain down fire on heretics, but we do have the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit being part of the Trinity that resides in us. And so Jesus Jesus called it the great comforter, one that he was sending to us because he had to go to prepare a place for us. And so God is still great and awesome. And even though sometimes it feels like we may be like Nehemiah, not knowing where our country is going or how we can get out of a situation or that there's no hope in different things. We know that there is always hope. And so Hebrews 11 tells us the hope is faith, but not just the hope part of it, but it's the assurance of things hoped for. And that's what faith is. It's having this assurance of things hoped for. And you know, we're not talking about things like a new Corvette, that we're hoping for a new Corvette or a big house, but this hope that is in God. Hope that as Christians we have eternal life with God and Jesus. Hope that this eternal life is not apart from our Creator, but in a place that was created for us to worship and commune with God the way that it was meant to be from the beginning. And so when we look at Adam and Eve, they were created and they communed with God. That's the way it was meant to be for them to have a relationship with God in which they were able to see and talk to Him and walk through the garden with Him. Uh, And it wasn't God who ended that relationship. It was Adam and Eve who ended it whenever they sinned. And so when it all is said and done, we will go back to being and communing with God. That will be the heaven is when we are back and communing with God. And we won't be apart from our Creator anymore. And we'll be able to worship Him and to be with Him. And so the reason that we have this hope that I'm talking about of being back with God and being able to commune with God the way that it was supposed to be is because of Jesus. And so Jesus, who died a thief's death on the worst possible form of torture that was ever devised in the ancient world. You may ask why some guy dying on a cross gives us hope. And it's because he died for our sins. Those who are called to believe in him will have forgiveness of sins and have eternal rest and communion with God. And so Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, a perfect lamb without spot or blemish, slain to cover the sins of the world, the final sacrifice needed to redeem his people. 
And just like Nehemiah was looking for the redemption of his people, and it, was, it was small. It was small in comparison to the redemption that God ultimately had in store. We're thinking of a, a small group of people who were living inside of Jerusalem who needed walls. They needed walls and they had a temple. A temple that was there to signify God with them. That's where God's spirit resided for them. Um, and just like whenever the veil was split, you know, at the, the rebuilt temple, whenever Jesus was crucified, the temple being destroyed signified that God was, was no longer with them. However, now we don't need a temple for God to reside with us because God resides in us. And so we are that temple. And it's all been given to us because of Jesus. And so when we think about this redemption, this, this small redemption that Nehemiah was looking for, it was just a man who was going to build some walls and allow for his people to come back, come back to, from a punishment that they had been justly given. And so the pu punishment that we justly deserve is, is exile from God. It's, it's not from our land. It's not from, uh, you know, my house here in Georgetown. Um, and it's not exile from my house to Georgetown to like the Sahara Desert. That'd be a pretty rough exile. Uh, but it's exile from the God that created us, the God who created us so that we could commune with him. Um, but the, it's exile to hell. Uh, eternal torment um, away from the God who created us. But, uh, but to God's glory, he has provided a propitiation for our sins. Um, Something that we don't deserve, it's a gift, free gift. Uh, so it's very great that we have that. And so I'm going to, I don't know, because we don't handshake anymore. We'll just stand up and pray. <laughs> and Rob will go stand out in the hot heat with his jacket on. Father Lord, thank you so much. For your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that we see that uh, Nehemiah's redemption for his country was, was small in comparison to the redemption that you were going to give to us, um, or the, the redemption that we have from, this, from our sins. And um, Lord, we know that we, are, that we are corrupt and that we have sinned against you. Um, Lord, we also know that we are promised forgiveness for those sins if we repent and believe in you. And so, Pray, Lord, that we, would, that we would do that, that we would repent, we would turn from any of our sins, Lord, and that we would have hope and assurance in this forgiveness that you have promised to us. Your son's holy name we pray. Amen.